Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining me today, and thanks for the intro, uh, Brian. Uh, I'm excited to uh, talk about things that you might not know the Jamstack can do, or things that you're excited the Jamstack can do. Uh, it's either like the Jamstack can do that, or the Jamstack can do that. Uh, it depends on how you decide to, to see it. Uh, but before I dive into uh, the topic, uh, I've been introduced already, but I'm just going to like repeat it. Why not? Uh, my name is Charlie Girard. Uh, I'm a staff engineer at Netlify. I've been there for uh, a couple of years. I used to build the Netlify app, so I was on the product team. Uh, you might be familiar with, with our UI. Uh, and for the past few months, I actually switched to a developer experience team. So I've had the opportunity to kind of like see the product from different angles, uh, which is really interesting. Uh, I am also part of the Google Developer Experts group, and my specialty is in uh, web technologies. Uh, if ever you have any question about that, feel free to reach, it, reach me uh, afterwards. Uh, I am the author of Practical Machine Learning in JavaScript, and overall, I am a self-proclaimed uh, creative technologist. I absolutely love exploring how far I can push the boundaries of what can be done uh, on the web, and hopefully I'll show you a bit of that in this talk. Uh, first of all, to make sure everyone is on the, the same page, I know that this whole conference is about the Jamstack, so uh, some of you might already know, but just in case people are just joining now, I'm just going to have a couple of slides defining the Jamstack. Uh, so J is for JavaScript, A for APIs, and M for markup. So it's a type of front-end architecture that relies on pre-rendering pages and serving them at the CDN level. So it's often used with static site generators, such as Gatsby, 11T, ViewPress, Hugo, uh, and many more. But the kind of issue with static site uh, generators being associated with the Jamstack is that there is still a common misconception that the Jamstack is only good for blogs or similar static sites. So people might think like a platform like Netlify is good for hosting your site projects, but not for bigger sites. However, that's not uh, necessarily true, especially with the growth of the API ecosystem you can build complex applications with this architecture. Uh, for example, Netlify is built on Netlify, and it's a fully featured developer tool that serves millions uh, of developers. But in this talk, I want to showcase a few different examples of things you can do in the Jamstack that you might not know about. So first of all, I want to talk about building real-time multi-user experiences. So if you have experimented or built applications in the past with real-time features, you might have used tools like Socket.io. But in general, to set up WebSockets uh, using this tool, you need to be running and configuring some kind of server. Uh, if we have a look, a look at a short code sample, if you wanted to set up Socket.io in, uh, in an Express server, you would start by requiring the Node.js modules needed then you would define uh, a route here, like a simple home route that would serve uh, a file. And uh, to start the WebSocket connection, um, you would do io. Uh, on connection. And here in this code sample, every time a user visits the page, it would log the message a user connected. And once the server side receives a message from the client side with the content chat message, it would log it. And finally, you would start your server on a specific port to start the app. However, this is not, if you push that code to, to Netlify, it's not going to work. Uh, the, the Jamstack, like this architecture, is about not having to really configure and run your own server. Um, so there is no way to run this particular piece of code right, like when you just push it uh, to Netlify. So how can you build real-time experiences on the Jamstack then? So this is where I want to talk about a very cool library called uh, Croquette. So I'm not going to go into too much details about the internals of how it works. Uh, but you know, here's a little animation that you can find on their, on their site that illustrates briefly how it works. So when a Crooked app starts, it connects to a nearby cloud-based reflector. And a reflector is a type of public server in the cloud. Uh, and it mirrors user inputs to a virtual computer running on each user's local client. So Crooked makes sure that these uh, virtual computers stay in synchronization. So every user has the same, same shared experience, even though no central server is coordinating things. Uh, I've, it's like a very brief uh, explanation. If you want to learn more, I would uh, recommend to check out the docs and a few, uh, a few blog posts. It's a type of architecture I didn't really know before. Um, but the most important thing to know is that there is no dedicated server and server-side code. 
So as a very, very small example, I built like a tiny demo of a real-time multi-user UI where a square follows the mouse of one client uh, connected and the change is reflected on the screen of the other client. So I wanted to build something a little bit more fancy, but I didn't get the time. And in a way I thought maybe actually that's a good thing. So I can show you a code sample of how to get started with this tool instead of showing something that's too uh, complex. So let's have a quick look at what uh, that code sample could, would look like to build something, uh, to start building something like this. So if you're implementing Crockett in a React app, for example, you would need to start by importing a model and some custom hooks from Crockett. So, and then this tool relies on a concept of model and view. The model handles the calculation and simulation. So here we're defining some initial properties. We have a position object with an X and Y. We have an array for the number of people connected, uh, etc. And then we have some logic to handle new users that will be connected to the app and to update the position of the element uh, on the screen. From there, we can have an app function that uh, registers the model on load, and then you wrap a component in a croquette session, um, and uh, you where you have to provide an, an, IP, uh, an API key and specify the model that you need to communicate with. And then finally, you have your animation display component uh, that uses some of Croquette's custom hook, uh, the first one to get the model reference. And here uh, I created a publish move uh, function that will publish some data back to the model when it's uh, invoked. And finally, we're calling this function inside an on mouse move uh, event. So we get the coordinates of the mouse movement to send it back to the model. So it updates the position of a square on the screens uh, of all the clients connected. And then we render um, the my little uh, I mean, I called it circle, but it's a square. Uh, and I finally were rendering like the, the deal with the coordinates. So this is like a very quick walkthrough. I don't expect people to understand uh, completely in like three slides how all of this uh, works under the hood. But the main goal is to show that you can start building real-time applications uh, and that can be done on the Jamstack, which is which is really cool. If you, you know, I've used to play with um, Socket.io quite a while and knowing that now I don't have to uh, set up the service sign myself and I can just do front-end code is, um, is really cool. And my little demo is only a square around the screen, but if you look at their documentation, you could start to think that you can create a Figma-like um, app only with that framework uh, on the Jamstack. And there's another tool that I discovered only a couple of days ago, so I'm not going to go into it at all, but I thought that I, I really wanted to mention it. It's called uh, Live Blocks. So it also allows you to do real-time experiences uh, on the Jamstack and that the, the example that I saw the other day was uh, a live, like a piano app that you could share with your friends and you could jam together. Um, but yes, I'm not going to have the time to go into this, but if, it, you know, if you're interested, you could have a look at Live Blocks as well. Now, another kind of technology you might not associate with the Jamstack is machine learning. So when you hear machine learning, you probably don't think about the Jamstack right after. Uh, but you can actually do some ML in the front end using the Jamstack architecture. So no real need to set up some complex uh, backend. One way to do ML in the front end is with the help of tools like uh, TensorFlow.js and ML5.js. So there are more tools out there. Uh, you know, it's available on, on GitHub if you want to do some, some searching. But if you're only getting started uh, with ML in JavaScript, I, these are the two that I would recommend. So apart from talking about the tools, I'm going to go through three different things that you can do with ML on the Jamstack. So first, using a pre-trained model. So a pre-trained model is a machine learning model that has already been trained with a lot of data. So you don't need to do the training yourself. I was trying to find some kind of analogy that maybe front end dev would uh, like that would make it easier for people to understand if you're not familiar with machine learning. So I kind of thought about like maybe like Webpack. So to be able to use Webpack, you don't have to know about what it does under the hood. You just you know indicate the files in your code base and where they are, and it generates new files based on some configuration. So it's kind of like mach like a machine learning model kind of feels like that as well. So using a pre-trained model, you can feed it some new sample data and it will return some predictions based on what it learned from the data that it was trained with. So let's go through an example of building a small demo to run some uh, toxicity classification on a piece of text. So you need to start by importing TensorFlow.js and the toxicity model. 
Then you need to load the model uh, and you can specify a threshold for accuracy between zero and one. So here I have 0 0.9 because I want it to be really accurate. Uh, but so zero would be, I don't care about the accuracy and closer to one would be, I want it to be really accurate. And then you can have a predict function where you call the classify method on the model, passing a sentence and returning some predictions. So if the match property on the prediction is true, it means that the sentence contains some toxic content. And from there, you can get a label representing the type of toxicity. For example, if it's an insult, a threat, something obscene, et cetera, and you can build the rest of your application with, uh, with that prediction. So in a few lines of code, this is adding ML to a purely front-end uh, application, which is pretty cool. Another thing that can be done is run custom algorithms in a serverless function. So Netlify functions are serverless functions and they allow you to write some backend code without having to configure a server. So I know that I said that the Jamstack allows you to like not have to write backend code, but like serverless functions allow you to leverage the ecosystem of Node.js modules that usually run on the server side, but without having to maintain or configure an actual server. So you can add functionality to your application without having to have so much backend knowledge. Uh, to dive a little bit more into how this works, uh, let's go through an example of using a Node.js uh, module that implements a machine learning algorithm called Random Forest Classifier. So if this means nothing to you, again, it's, it's totally fine. I don't expect you to be uh, machine learning experts. The main goal is to see how it can be used uh, in Jamstack applications. So this code sample is about predicting the species of uh, a flower based on some properties like petal length, width, et cetera. So that's a, a classic uh, kind of like starter uh, project that you would do in machine learning. And that's why uh, I chose it. So we start by requiring the module. Um, and then here we have, I have a variable called like test data that will hold the value passed to the serverless function when it's invoked. Uh, so you could think that your page would have um, an input HTML element in which a user could write something about the properties of, of a flower that they want to predict and uh, on submit, or you invoke the serverless function that runs some machine learning. So here we have the original data set, very, very small, uh, but that is going to be used to train the algorithm. So we have an array of three different objects that contains the properties of flowers and their species. So it's different from the previous example, because at this point, there is no pre-trained model. We're going to run the training step inside the serverless function. Uh, then we create a new instance of the classifier and we give it our training data with the fit method. Uh, we indicate which property we want to predict. Uh, so here, the species. And then we call the predict method, passing it our new data coming from our request um, that should not have species indicated because this is what we're trying to predict. And finally, we're returning the prediction in the body so we can display in the front end if we want. So in this example, we can see that we wouldn't be able to run this code uh, completely client side because it's a Node.js specific module, but we can leverage serverless functions to be able to use this, uh, this module without having to set up some, some backend environment. And finally, we can do some ML by calling some APIs. So here uh, we're gonna see how to use the uh, deep AI to do some AI automated uh, content moderation. So here we're in a serverless function again, we start by requiring a deep AI. Then we set our API key and we call the call standard API method with the type of classification we want to do uh, here, content moderation. And we pass it uh, the link to uh, the path to an image. And here is probably a cat. Um, and finally, we return something from our function that has the output of the prediction. So again, in a few lines of code, we can add some machine learning to a Jamstack site. Uh, but even though that's you know, pretty exciting and hopefully maybe you have some ideas of things that you want to play with, uh, there are some limits to keep in mind that I, I'd like to mention or that I would need to mention. So first of all, do not use uh, the Node.js implementation of TensorFlow JS. Um, not in a Jamstack app. So even though I showed you how to import a pre-trained model as a client-side package, TensorFlow.js also has a Node.js implementation that you can use. Uh, at first, I thought it would be cool to use it in a serverless function, but this is where I realized that there are limits to this. Uh, Netlify functions run for a maximum of 10 seconds, and sometimes loading a TensorFlow.js model uh, in your application can take longer. 
So my function was failing. It was basically not actually finishing uh, to, to run what it was supposed to run in 10 seconds. So it was just failing. For longer running tasks, uh, you can use background functions that run for a maximum of 15 minutes. But then there are implications in terms of your user experience, because if the user has to wait for so long to get the predictions back, that's not super great. So that's why if you want to use TensorFlow.js, I would recommend to use it uh, client side and only use the pre-trained model feature or also something called transfer learning that I didn't talk about, um, but not try to create your own model uh, unless you're building an application that's about uh, you know, having some kind of graph that shows the training process. So the user would be expecting some delay, but otherwise uh, I wouldn't really recommend running the, the Node.js implementation. Uh, but also serverless functions cannot exceed uh, 50 megabytes. So depending on the amount of Node.js modules you're requiring, uh, your functions might fail. If you do come across this issue, one workaround is to split your logic into uh, multiple functions. But depending on what you're doing, this might not be possible. And also that's not always the best architecture to have to split something um, into multiple functions if it's actually supposed to only do one thing. So now that I showed how to create uh, real-time multi-user experiences and do some uh, ML on the Jamstack, I want to talk about a third thing that you might not know can be done uh, on the Jamstack. And this is IoT. And that's like the latest thing that I've been looking into. Uh, so Internet of Things, in case uh, people are, 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 not, are not familiar. But for this one, I'm going to focus on the uh, Philips Hue lights. So there are, um, these are internet connected lights. Uh, you know, I think that I've seen a lot of people having lights in the background, like mine is running right now. So some of you probably have some, if you don't have Philips Hue light, you might have other lights, but in general, you can control them with an app on your phone. Uh, but you can also control them using JavaScript because uh, there's an API that you can ping. So I've been looking into controlling them on the Jamstack using serverless functions. Before I dive into the code, I want to share a little live demo with you in the chat, but considering that there is a little delay, I might like keep going with my slides while you're playing with the demo. I don't know, let's just like see what happens. I'll just share it and see what people do. Uh, <laughs> so there's only three buttons in the UI. Uh, it's like green, red, and purple, and that should be connected to whatever is my lights are behind me. So yeah, okay, so people are starting, okay, so it's working, woohoo! Uh, so it's like there's no throttling or anything, so uh, if it crashes because too many people do it, uh, I'll just restart them. But uh, yeah, so uh, now that I can see that it's doing something uh, in the background, I'll let people play with it, but I'll keep going <laughs> with showing my code sample. Uh, so, okay, so knowing that the Philips Hue uh, light bulbs um, have uh, an API, I start by requiring uh, the node fetch package. And then I defined a command uh, that I want, it's really going wild in the back. I love it, woo! Anyway, uh, so I start by uh, defining a command I want to send. And here I'm changing uh, the color of a to a specific one. Uh, I also specify the IP address of my lights and the username to be able to uh, authenticate. Like there's like a party going in my room now. Uh, so um, then you can notice that I'm using process.env. Uh, and the great thing about Netlify functions is that these secret tokens are pulled directly from the one that I saved uh, in the UI. So no need to have a .env file or, or anything to be uh, requiring these, um, these environment variables. So then if I do have uh, the IP address, I fetched it uh, from Netlify and I have a username to authenticate to um, my request that I'm doing to the Philips API, I do a put request to my lights to, uh, to send the command. So in a few lines of code, I can tinker and learn more about, about IoT. But there's at this point, if we only look at this piece of code, there's a catch that I, I need to mention. And this is where it's gonna get like, if, I mean, I got really into this. So hopefully you'll find that interesting as well. So first of all, the piece of code I just showed you does not work once deployed, or at least not as it is. So bear with me. Uh, it's kind of like it works on my machine, but it's going to get more interesting. So the reason why um, it, does, it doesn't work once deployed is that the IP address of the Philips Hue lights is private to my local network. So it's not publicly accessible. So as the code is running from a serverless function, it is trying to ping the API using my private IP address that does not exist outside of my local network. So there's multiple ways around this. 
One is called port forwarding, and you can basically configure your router to expose a specific IP address publicly. And this could then allow the lights to be controlled from a deployed function. However, I would not recommend um, port forwarding for security reasons. Uh, depending on where you live, if, you, if you're in an apartment block that has like a lot of people around, some people might be looking at all IP addresses around, doing some shady stuff. Uh, and if they do see the IP address of your lights that you made it public, they could easily uh, ping it and remotely control your lights. And that could end up being an access point to other devices on your network. So I would not recommend doing that. You can try, uh, but then don't blame me if something bad happens. So um, there is some extra work to get it to work when deployed. But even just as is, uh, I, I think it's still pretty exciting from a learning point of view to be able to tinker and learn more about IoT while being a front-end developer. Because the code sample I, I showed you with uh, the IP address, it would still work locally. It just can't be controlled from outside. So there's another workaround using a Cloudflare uh, where you can use, I think it's Cloudflare Tunnel, as some kind of bridge between your local network and a publicly available URL. But when I went through some blog posts, um, the idea of having to spend some time setting up a Cloudflare account, set up some configs in a dashboard, that didn't really excite me. So I tried to find uh, another way and uh, I did. It was a bit more complicated, but it was also a bit more fun. So the way I personally went about it is to use a, a Raspberry Pi and the Netlify CLI. So to make it work, the Raspberry Pi is not necessary. Uh, you can run what I'm about to show you on your laptop, uh, but I usually have multiple terminals, windows open, tabs open, and running different apps. So I would probably forget which is running what, and if I close it, then my, my uh, experiment is not working anymore. Uh, whereas on the Raspberry Pi, I can run that independently. I have it in a corner of my apartment and I kind of like don't care anymore. So you can also run that in like a second laptop if you want. Uh, but the main thing that makes it work is this command, Netlify dev dash dash live. So if you haven't used the Netlify CLI before, uh, running Netlify dev starts your local server like yarn start or npm start. But adding the dash dash live flag opens a tunnel between your local host and the URL that you can share with anyone in the world. So that URL is publicly available. It would look something like this. I think that's exactly the one that's running right now, actually. So that URL looks something uh, like this. You have my sat name. So the one that you that I shared with you is uh, doesn't have the hash and the live, um, but the one that's running on my Raspberry Pi has the dot live and and the hash. Um, so what's going on then is that in what on what I deployed uh, on Netlify. Uh, it's actually, so in my UI, I can use that public URL generated by Netlify dev dash dash live, and I do a fetch request and send a particular color to trigger my lights. And here you go. You got some Netlify powered uh, IoT that I hope you had fun playing with. Um, if you don't want to use the Netlify CLI, no worries. Uh, there are other tools that create tunnels like ngrok or a local tunnel. I try them both so it works. Uh, personally, I find the Netlify CLI more convenient, but it's all up to you. The most important part is understanding that um, to get this to work uh, from outside, you know, for people to be able to remotely control it, you need some kind of publicly available URL. But doing it on your local network with only uh, your internal IP addresses is totally fine as well. So in this example, I showed you how to interact with an IoT device that has an API. Uh, but what's really cool with IoT is to build your own devices so just as in FYI, this solution also works to interact with internet connected Arduinos. So I tried it with the Arduino 33 Nano uh, IoT and I got uh, just a built-in LED to turn on and off by pinging a Netlify function. So for this microcontroller, I had to write some Arduino code that needed to be uploaded to the board. So not all of it is JavaScript, but you could imagine a solution where the Arduino code is already all written up and what users have to do is just upload it, uh, which could be done via a website using web USB. And then you would kind of indicate the types of comment that can be sent to it in JavaScript. So from a user's point of view, they, would, um, they wouldn't need to know much Arduino at all. So talking about triggering the built-in LED maybe isn't the most exciting thing, but you can connect lots of different sensors and actuators to the board and send uh, comments via JS. So if we look quickly at the code sample for the function that communicates with the Arduino, there's not much difference from the one triggering uh, the Philips lights. I still need a device IP address that's on my local network. And the, then the syntax for the second argument that I passed in the URL, the comment is a little bit different because in Arduino, I'm handling messages by looking at uh, URL parameters. It, it wouldn't work the same way as, as the API exposed by Philips. 
So I'm quite excited to keep diving into this hardware plus Jamstack thing, because uh, I've been playing with Arduinos for a while. And if there's something new to learn or new ways to make it work, I'm all for it. Uh, but also, I'm always happy to find ways to maybe bring more people on board to trying things, because uh, it's just really fun. Uh, if you're interested and you're not quite sure what to build, one idea would be to build some build lights. Uh, if you're using Netlify, you can use what is called event triggered function. Uh, so if you call one of your serverless functions uh, deploy-failed.js, for example, whatever is in this function will be triggered when a deploy fails. So you could turn your lights red when a deploy fails and back to green when it's all good. Uh, but even if you don't use Netlify, I'm sure that whatever platform you're using has some kind of webhooks uh, that you can use to also trigger lights based on events. And you can go from there. Uh, but anyway, one last thing uh, that's kind of pushing the limits of the Jamstack is uh, interactive installations. So once again, kind of bringing the Jamstack outside of the browser, but what do I mean by interactive installations? Before I show a couple of examples, I want to talk about how. So there's a few web APIs that can be used to connect devices to front-end applications, such as Web Bluetooth, Web USB, and Web MIDI. Again, no backend required. Uh, using these APIs definitely fits into the Jamstack because it's just like JavaScript and like APIs, uh, and you can build some really fun stuff with them. So a first example is this uh, hoverboard project that I built using the Daydream Google controller, uh, Web Bluetooth, and 3GS. So uh, I have a little controller device that tracks changes in movement using an accelerometer and gyroscope. So I connected this device to my UI using Web Bluetooth. So all the data is sent to the browser using that Web API. I then attached the device to a skateboard on the floor and I stood on the skateboard and when I tilt you know, left and right, I update my 3D environments uh, built using 3GS. And then I projecting the, projected the whole thing on a wall because it was just more fun than being in front of my small laptop screen. Uh, but I actually had the, the opportunity to showcase that installation at a real in-person conference in, in Singapore before the pandemic. Uh, so other people could, uh, could give it a, a try. So even if it looks like, oh, it's just running in my browser, actually, no, you can take that out of um, like in the world and have other people use it as an installation. And it's all running uh, in the front end. If you know JavaScript, you can build projects like these uh, on the Jamstack. Uh, another project that I, that I built a couple of years ago uh, connected some drumsticks with hardware that was measuring acceleration and movement, uh, connected them to a front end via Web Bluetooth as well. And it was sending over MIDI commands so I could trigger whatever I wanted in the UI. So it's kind of like in the Jamstack, you can connect a lot of different pieces to create some, uh, some cool stuff. So, I don't know if you see, but there's like the little lights on the drumsticks. These are like devices attached and I had some uh, attached to my feet as well. And uh, depending on where I was hitting, it was different sounds and, and triggering animations uh, and stuff. So all of it in the Jamstack as well. Um, but anyway, I'm going to the end. I'm getting to the end of this talk. Uh, so as a recap, if you have to remember only a few points, uh, it would be that uh, Jamstack is not only for blogs, uh, especially with the growth of the uh, API ecosystem and serverless functions, there are really tons of things uh, that you can build. But here I mentioned real-time multi-user experiences, machine learning, IoT, but this list is not exhaustive and I'm still researching other types of applications that could kind of like push the boundaries. Uh, I mean, you can also do AR, VR and mixed reality all in JavaScript as well. Uh, you know, with the whole like metaverse or like, just VR, really. Uh, if you're scared that as a Jest dev you're missing out, you can learn about how to build 3D environments uh, using JavaScript and, and run um, a web VR experiment on an Oculus Quest. Like that's possible. And finally, uh, serverless functions are great. Uh, even if you don't run machine learning uh, in your app, even if you're not excited at all about anything that I, that I mentioned, I would still recommend that you give it a try and look at other examples out there because it can really uh, give more power to your, to your application. But on this, uh, thank you so much for listening and uh, playing with my lights. Uh, so I know that I threw a lot of information at you in this talk, so I don't expect you to remember everything uh, at all. Uh, I'm here if you have any questions, but if nothing comes to mind right now, no problem. Uh, you can reach me later. I'm uh, devdevcharlie on Twitter. But uh, otherwise, uh, thank you, everyone. And thanks, uh, JamDevDev, for having me. That was amazing. Um, you are definitely far more creative than I am. Uh, <laughs> I think I think it's it's pretty impressive all the different ideas you had of how to integrate all these different things. Um, so I 
I know I was inspired to kind of come up with some new, new things. Uh, so hopefully other people were too. One of the things I was going to, uh, before, there's a couple of audience questions already and folks feel free to keep asking questions. We, we still got some time. Um, one of the things I, I think was interesting was that, I mean, apart from Croquette, which, you know, you seem like I had some built in hooks and react components, like everything you're showing doesn't matter what tool I'm building, whether I'm using React or I'm using yes, Vue. Exactly. I mean, it's this is going to work anywhere, right? Because I'm just using JavaScript and I'm using APIs, right? Yeah, I'm a big fan of vanilla JavaScript. Uh, every time that I try to experiment with something new, I usually don't start with a framework because it's just too much. I just want to make it work. I don't want to bother spinning up a, a React app or like not, you know, React or whatever other, you know, framework. Uh, right. I, you know, still love vanilla GS. So anything that just like that works without having to set up anything, I, I love that. Totally. Yeah. And so you, even, even you were using at the end there to standard like browser APIs, like the web Bluetooth, web MIDI, uh, the just, yeah. I think it's easy to forget how much you can just do without having to necessarily rely on a, a ton of, of, of framework code and things like that. Um, Nothing, not that there's anything wrong with the framework. Love, you know, I use <laughs> whatever <laughs> works, but I still, exactly. I still love vanilla JS. So, yeah, me too. I mean, I, I, I think even getting to that point, like, I think there's sometimes a misconception that Jamstack is like, oh, it's, it's, you have to do the front end has to be all JavaScript, React, or Vue, or whatever. Um, but I still, I mean, I still run great sites that still work with Hugo, for instance, that are just mm -hmm. purely static, but still have like authentication, still have a dynamic, a search and, and so on, like that don't necessarily have to throw all the tools I think tools that's, in. that's what I really like about the API part of the Jamstack is that it's framework agnostic. You can add a lot of different services by, you know, adding services that just use APIs and you just ping stuff and it's more, it kind of leaves you with like the decision of the tooling that you want to use. It's not like, oh, here's a code sample that's only a React code sample. It's like, no, let people choose what they want to use. <laughs> exactly. So um, Tom asks for static sites, are there limitations on how easily or, or how much state can be managed when leveraging backend APIs or functions? Any recommendations of tools to make managing state on a static site easier? Whoa. Uh, That's a, yeah, right a lot now, there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right now, I don't think I would have a good answer for this. Uh, I'm going to say I don't know. OK. <laughs> That's it. <I'm> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I guess if, if you know, we're talking about managing state. It depends on like there's client side state and there's like server side state. So, I mean, I guess it depends on which state you're talking about. Um, yeah. I don't, and yeah. Yeah. I mean, this would be one of those things like, like a lot of uh, like things like uh, Svelte kit or whatever, you know, um, or Next.js have built in stuff for handling state as well. So, um, that may be one of the places where a framework makes sense. Yeah. Um, okay. When you say devices for web USB, web Bluetooth, what mm -hmm. kinds of devices would these be for accelerometers and other sensors? Uh, so not everything works. So for example, with web Bluetooth, um, it has to be Bluetooth low energy. So if, um, if a device is using Bluetooth, that is like a previous, uh, version that doesn't always work. So I have a pair of headsets that don't connect via web Bluetooth, but, um, but I saw experiments with a pod pro that were, that was working with, uh, with web Bluetooth and you could use the accelerometer and the gestures and stuff to trigger stuff in, in the UI. So, uh, as usually, as long as, uh, for web Bluetooth, as long as a device is Bluetooth low energy, it should be working with the API, uh, for web USB. I did try it. Uh, I did try to upload a sketch an Arduino sketch uh, via web USB. So that was working. Um, I think that usually I'm not quite sure exactly the like if there's different types of USB stuff, I'm not sure about that, but I think that you might have um, 
stuff for like keyboards. I think that maybe if you wanted to trigger lights on your keyboard via web USB or something, maybe you could do that. Uh, and for web MIDI, um, I have not tried it directly, but MIDI is like usually a type of messages that are, that are sent. So if you have like um, uh, an instrument uh, that sends MIDI messages, I think usually uh, for people who are experimenting with music in JavaScript, I think they're using uh, the web MIDI API to uh, connect to their controllers, but I'm not 100% sure. So don't quote me uh, on this. I've mostly used web USB, uh, web Bluetooth and web USB once with uh, Arduino, but uh, a while ago. Um, so I don't know if there's, uh, there's examples that you can find on GitHub. I don't know if there's a list of available um, devices that, that people have tried, but uh, I wanted to get more into the two other APIs I haven't tried yet, but <laughs> later. Yep, makes sense. Um, so so let me ask you again about the, the light demo. Um, mm -hmm. So when you, you're running the application that people connected to where they're actually clicking to change the lights, yep. is that's, that's actually running on Netlify, right? Yeah. And that's, and then, but you then you're also is it a separate application that's running on the back end to manage like that you're connecting to that's running on that Arduino, um, or is it the same so application? I have the same repo running on once, but it was just like a personal choice. Uh, the only thing that needs to be running on the Raspberry Pi is the actual uh, function, the the function code that connects to the IP address of my lights on my local network okay. that needs to run on the Raspberry Pi because then. Uh, with Netlify Dev dash dash live, it's uh, it's doing that tunnel between my local host and the public uh, URL. But on Netlify is the part of the is the UI that pings the the okay. URL generated. So I have the same repo running, but it was just a choice. Uh, I could have just a function file running on my Raspberry Pi. Like all I right. need is the, the the URL exposed so that I can ping it. Right, because it, so it's running on the Raspberry Pi. Obviously, there's no UI, but it it's no. but it is proxying there that, could be, that but function. I don't need it. Yeah. yeah. Right. So it's just proxying the function off to. So when so you're calling when you call that function within within your application, you're actually calling it on the on the, on Raspberry, the Raspberry Pi, not yeah. yeah. That is cool. I would have I, I wouldn't have thought of like that particular solution. I, I have used things a, like a lot of different solutions, and this one was like, oh, that's cool. I can because I I think I wanted the constraint of like, can I like just use Netlify like only Netlify things? Can I try to do that? And at first, uh, I was using a local tunnel uh, because uh, the. Uh, the Netlify, like the live uh, feature of the Netlify CLI wasn't working on the Raspberry Pi uh, because of a uh, architecture problem, and uh, like I, yeah, this is where I I, oh, I also use that project to improve the CLI because there was a problem with um, I think it was there was a tool used that was running on the AMD sixty four architecture and Raspberry Pi is ARM sixty four. I don't really know that much about that. I learned about it while debugging the thing. Uh, and now, huh. it, now it works. So I, we also improved the CLI because I had just a quick look into this. So, you know, even <laughs> if you don't do IoT stuff, sometimes you end up uh, improving the product you work for by going in weird ways. So, <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. That's awesome. So, um, <laughs> so to, if for people you said who want to get started with the, the um, you know, doing, sorry, machine learning, your recommendation was to to start with TensorFlow JS, or you said ML JS. Do they both like uh, they both ML5, accomplish ML five ML5. JS? Okay, and they, are they both basically the same thing, just different libraries, or or they so do different I, things? They do well. TensorFlow JS does more things, mm -hmm. um, but I think so. From what I understand, the purpose of ML5.js uh, is to provide a more accessible way to get into machine learning, because I think it's built on top of TensorFlow.js, but TensorFlow.js sometimes has some um, jargon that can be a bit scary, like what's a tensor and all that stuff. And it feels mm -hmm. like you might have to know a lot more before using it. And ML5.js is trying to expose the, the easier models to use or the easier ways to, to do things so people are 
less scared to, to go into machine learning, but you can do object detection in images. You can do text classification that I showed uh, in ML5.js. So if it's maybe like your very first time, uh, I would recommend to look at one of the examples of, uh, of ML5.js. And, uh, and then as you feel more comfortable and you want to build more custom things, you can slowly um, get into TensorFlow.js. I mean, you can also start right away with TensorFlow.js, but I feel like sometimes people are maybe like a little bit scared of getting into this. So that's why I also mention um, MFI.js as well. Right, awesome. Yeah, and uh, and I think you, for me, I took a lot of notes of like different libraries and stuff I want to check out. The real-time stuff was was amazing. I didn't even know those really existed. Um, I, I'd me only neither. seen the web so, yeah. stuff. So yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty awesome. Really exciting. Definitely. Yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, sorry. No, no, go ahead. I, I, I you know, no, I think it's just that, that yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, let's just, let's just go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but so that one was croquet, right? Croquet or croquet? Yeah. Uh, I, croquet? I don't know. I said croquet, but I don't know if it's croquet. I don't know. So yeah. if somebody knows, they can tell me. And so is that so is that like completely free or is is that something like a service you have to pay for? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure. For the thing that I built, I didn't pay. Um, okay. But maybe as you, maybe if you want to be able to have more like a certain amount of users uh, access an app, maybe maybe it starts costing money. I'm not sure actually, uh, we would have to double check that because, but for my prototype to get started and look into it, it was free. Okay, very cool. I, I love how your lights are still changing back there on occasion, yeah, like people are still <laughs> messing with it. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, I, as if there's a delay, it means people might be clicking and it's actually not happening until a few seconds later. <laughs> so, <laughs> Well, this, this was amazing. I, I, like I said, I had a, I got a lot of ideas um, and a lot of libraries to check out. And I, I think it, like I said, it was, it was great. And that it shows that like, there's so much more than just like the standard application that we get. We always talk about building. You can just do pretty much anything. There's so yes, absolutely, uh, yeah, absolutely fantastic.